Please bow and pray with me. Lord, come and take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our wills and bend them to yours. And finally, Lord, we pray that you would take our hearts and fill them with love for you and love for others. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If you will, take out your Bibles and turn to John 13. We're going to look at this section where in John's gospel, it is the Lord's Supper, but there is a focus on the washing of the feet. And I will begin in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taken a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Well, let me begin with a question. Are there any coffee drinkers out there? I know I had a cup about an hour ago. And it's kicking in. Feels good. Well, I love coffee, and my family knows that I love coffee, and therefore, for many birthdays and Christmases, I get a new coffee mug. Now, these are legendary cups. I, of course, have an Alabama coffee mug, Roll Tide. I have a, a, a little Nemo one. You remember the seagulls? If you've been in my office, you've seen it. You remember they say, mine, mine, mine. But my favorite one is a recent one. And it has flowers on it. And it reads this. It says, my favorite people call me grandma. (laughs) My boys thought that would be very hilarious. And I drink that with pride. Another favorite of mine has a lion on it. And just think about how majestic lions look. How beautiful they are as creatures. I think this one came from World Market. And so on the one side, it has that handsome creature. But on the other side, it says, it is tough to be king. It's as humorous as it is telling, because that's how most of us view power, authority, and leadership. It is more about status and honor than anything else. And many will do anything they can and use anyone they can in order to get it. This is true not only today, but also in the time of Christ. In Jesus' day, There were Pharisees, and they loved to lord their authority over the people. Love this power and authority and leadership led this powerful group to crucify Jesus. Why? Well, because he threatened that which they held dear. But do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but what? But to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This revelation is shocking to us because we love power. We love being in control. But in the gospel, we find one who came not to gain power, but to give it away. That is what we are going to find out tonight as we study through John's gospel. This Monday, Thursday. And for anyone that is new to the Anglican world, you're thinking, what is Monday, Thursday? And I'm glad you asked. Because monday comes from the Latin mandatum, which means mandate or commandment. On this day, we commemorate the commandment Jesus gave to his disciples. This is why your Bibles are open, because you can turn with me to John 13, verse 34. This is the new commandment. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. In fact, the world will, we, will know that we are his disciples. How? Because of our love. And as we turn to John 13, we're going to discover three things. We're going to look and examine the Passover. We're going to see a power struggle. And then finally, we're going to find a parable, Right? So the Passover, a power struggle, and a parable. Three Ps. Easy enough. First, the Passover. In verse 1, John points out that the Last Supper happened during Passover. This is what he says in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come 
Now, it's not an accident that he is pointing us to the Passover. Anytime he mentions a Jewish festival in his gospel, he wants us to see that they actually apply and connect to Jesus. Well, what is the Passover? It was a special time of year in which the Jews commemorated the time when their God, the God of Israel, supernaturally freed them from slavery to Egypt. Pharaoh, you will recall, wouldn't let his people go. And so God persuaded Pharaoh. He sent plagues. But there was um, some hemming and hawing. And then finally, God sent a final plague. And do you know what that final plague was that ultimately uh, became the, the straw that broke the camel's back? It was the Passover, where God passed over all of Egypt and struck down the firstborn of every creature, both humans and every animal. And who was it that was spared? How could you be spared? Anyone? Only those who sought shelter under the blood of the lamb. It's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> Now fast forward to John's gospel. In John chapter 1 verse 29, do you remember what John the Baptist said upon seeing Jesus when he came to the Jordan River? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But wait a second. We just were talking about the Passover. What blood did people seek shelter under? The Lamb. And Jesus shows up. And the great prophet says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, next, we're in John chapter 2, and Jesus cleanses the temple, and there was a, a messianic fervor, and people were expecting the Messiah to show up, and so they see Jesus doing these things, and they say, what signs do you give that show that, you know, you're, you know, you have authority to do this? And you remember what Jesus said? Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, we know that he was referring to his body. Then we're in John chapter 6. Also during the Passover, and Jesus feeds 5,000 people. And do you remember what he told them about being able to feed them? This is John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, in John 13, Jesus is back in Jerusalem, and there is another Passover. But instead of describing the meal as the other Gospels do, he explains what the meal is about by washing his disciples' feet. So why is the Passover important? Well, because it points us towards how God would ultimately serve humanity and free us from slavery to Satan's sin and even death itself. And speaking of Satan, that brings us to our second point, which is a power struggle. And we find this power struggle in verse 2. This is what John tells us. During supper, when the devil had put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the father, father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Now, while in our minds we read this passage and we go right to the foot washing, what John wants us to see is this power struggle. He wants us to see this contrast between Judas and Jesus. Judas was influenced by someone. And he says it clearly in verse 2. Did you catch who was influencing Judas? Satan. That's right. But Jesus, well, he is influenced by God. In fact, he is God incarnate. And he has been given all things, all power. And here's the contrast. Jesus was giving his very life for his disciples. While Judas was going to sell Jesus out. Do you remember for how much? 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was faithful to the end, while Judas showed himself to be a traitor. But most importantly is the mention of the devil. Why? Because John ultimately wants us to contrast Satan with God. Satan's way is simply to use others for his own gain. Is that not what Judas is doing? Whether in the garden or in the wilderness, Satan only cares about us when he can use us. But look at Jesus. What does he gain in pursuing us? Well, do you all know what tomorrow is? Good Friday. Was it good for him? It's good for us. What did he gain 
other than our sin and our unrighteousness. But he also wins us back from Satan. Remember, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to what? What? Offer my body as a ransom. Ransom, that's interesting, isn't it? Mark talks about this, Mark's gospel. He has that strange line where he says, unless the strong man is bound, no one can go into his house and plunder it. New Testament scholars, who is the strong man? It's Satan. And so what happened on the cross? He is bound. And so he, is, he does not have the same power. And what's happening right now? Jesus, through his people, is plundering his house. It's almost like the Bible has a theme. Doesn't it seem like that to you? That's what we see. Note the difference. Jesus' glory was to give up his power in order to give it to us. Meanwhile, Satan was seeking glory at our expense. And how did that work out for Judas? I mean, do you remember the Sunday's gospel? It said it would, it would have been better had he never been born. It cost him his life. For in the end, that is what Satan has come to do. And Jesus talks about this as we're, we're journeying through John. So let's go to John chapter 10. He says of Satan, the thief, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says that he does something as the good shepherd. Also in the same verse, I came that they might have life and have it what? Abundantly. So what is the difference between Satan and God? One seeks power at all costs and the other seeks to give away power at extravagant cost. Third, the parable. The parable is found in Jesus' washing of his disciples' feet. Jesus rose from supper just as he rose from his place of perfect for, per, uh, fellowship within the Godhead. Before the incarnation, he stepped up and rose out of that fellowship which he had with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. What does he do? Well, he lays his garments aside just as he had temporarily set aside his glorious existence he takes a towel just as he took on himself human flesh and became a servant he wraps a towel around his waist because he had come to serve he pours water into the basin just as he would pour out his blood upon the cross for our redemption he washes his disciples feet just as he cleanses all those who turn to him from all unrighteousness. On this remarkable occasion, Jesus paints a beautiful portrait of his whole life, from birth to death to resurrection. It was a dramatization of Philippians 2. And perhaps when I was going through the list, you, you heard Philippians 2 in your mind, specifically verses 5 through 9. And listen to what Paul says. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not regard equality with God Something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. You can almost see Jesus going from disciple to disciple, washing their feet. Can you imagine coming to Thomas? And he knows what's going to happen. What's Thomas going to famously do? Doubt the resurrection. He comes to his beloved, right? That's John's name. He doesn't refer to himself uh, in the gospel. But you know it's him because he refers to himself as the beloved. And so he comes to John and he knows this is the one who's going to take care of his mother after his crucifixion. And he comes to Peter, good old Peter. Always something to say, never the right thing, right? <laughs> And here it's no different because he begins to speak, doesn't he? And he says to Jesus, no. His response was understandable since even Hebrew slaves did not do this task, right? Because, and I love this, the, the boys have a children's Bible and they talk about, you know, washing people's feet. And uh, David Suchet is, uh, is the, 
uh, we listened to it on Audible. And so he asked the question, you know, why do you think that it wasn't a good idea to, to wash people's feet in that day? But then think about it. You know, we don't, they didn't have paved roads or cars going around. Um, they had animals that carried them around. And, and guess what was in the streets and where they walked? Yeah, not good stuff. And so to clean that off was a very lowly and menial task. But that is the point, isn't it? Jesus would become even more undignified on the cross. Hence, Jesus tells Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me, in verse 8. Peter replied, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. But here again, Peter speaks beyond his understanding. As Jesus goes on to explain in verses 10 through 11, a person who has, a, who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. What was that about? Well, when we turn to Jesus, we become instantly clean. Judas, however, was not clean because he did not turn all the way to Jesus. It's interesting that this foot washing event happens during the Last Supper. For the supper itself is a reminder and a foretaste of the fact that once we turn to Christ, we are forgiven, we are cleansed, and we are invited to his table, the great wedding banquet of the Lamb. When Peter objects to Jesus washing him, it, it really does parallel his objection to Jesus going to the cross. Remember in Mark uh, chapter 8, he says, I'm going to the cross. And Peter begins to rebuke him. And do you remember what Jesus told Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Satan, did you see this power struggle? He's not far behind. If you begin following Jesus, guess who will start vying for your attention? That's right, it's Satan. Neither Peter nor the others have yet understood why Jesus came. John is telling us to keep our eye upon Peter as the story moves along so that we can see what will happen to him in the end. And do you remember what Jesus says to Peter when he is being restored after the resurrection? Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. That's John 21. Lambs and lions are referenced throughout the scripture. And we see that scripture depicts Jesus as both a lion and a lamb. Do you know that? You, you know that when Jacob was blessing his children... And he said that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. He referred to Judah as the lion. And that's why when we sing about Jesus, we, we sing that song. Hail, hail, lion of Judah. How wonderful you are. Amazingly, the gospel teaches us, teaches us that though Jesus was the ultimate lion, he had all the power, he had all the authority. Jesus became a lamb so that you and I could become lions, part of the tribe of Judah. Though he was the eternal king, do you realize that he became a pauper in order that we could become his royal heirs? Well, before we end, John wants us to answer a couple of questions. Tonight, are we like Judas, refusing to turn to Jesus in some area of our life? He is saying, don't wait. Turn to him now. What he has to offer is worth far more than whatever 30 pieces of silver you are currently pursuing. Second question, are we like Peter? Have we already turned to Christ and yet we are currently struggling to love one of Christ's other lambs? Y'all ever have that problem? Y'all ever realize that the, the fellow followers of Christ that are going to be with you in eternity and you find it actually easier to love non-believers than it is some of the other lambs. So how, pray tell, can we show such people love? It's only when we turn towards the Lamb of God and we see that he took away our sin that we can truly love those people. To the extent that we have experienced Christ's love, will be the extent to which we will, be to sh we will be able to share that love with others. To the degree that we have allowed Christ to serve us will be the degree 
to which we will be able to serve others. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this important night of nights. And as you moved so powerfully and spoke to your people, your disciples, in the Last Supper, and you laid your righteous garments to the side and took up a towel and served them, help us see that you have done that for us on the cross. And you have not just comforted us so that we are comfortable but you have comforted us so that we might go out and comfort a world that is dying. Help us understand this this evening, tomorrow, during Good Friday. And help us rejoice come Sunday morning. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.